My name is Kaisa Onsus. I come from a company called Grundteknik, which means ground technics, actually. And, and we are working a lot with geotechnical uh, problems and also with environmental problems. We have a small team working with environmental problems, and especially Norton. And first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Dalbor and his team for inviting us here to this uh, fantastic country of yours. It's been a real pleasure to be here and it's a great honor to be able to share our knowledge and our experiences from the Notodden site, which I, which I see is actually very close to what you have here in Dugurat on your site. So um, just feel free to ask any questions uh, as we go on with the presentation. Um, and I will try to do my best uh, answering. Uh, you saw quite a lot of pictures from Janne's presentation of where we are, how this is in Notodden, how the area is. It's situated by the lake and we have the river coming down just aside uh, the site. And we also have another river uh, a little bit upstreams in the lake. And the, I would say the lake is about, I don't have a good picture, but the lake is about 30 kilometers long or something. Can that be, yeah, and maybe a few kilometers wide. Yeah, I think so. So it's not a very big lake, but it's, uh, well, with, with Norwegian, uh, uh, I think uh, we say quite a big lake. <laughs> That was not the right one. That was the right one. I'm going to talk a little bit about the frameworks for cleaning up of contaminated sites in Norway. Uh, and we have what we have of authorities and how the Norwegian legislation works. And we also have a lot of guidelines how we do uh, investigations and those things. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that first. At sort of the framework for everything we've been doing. And uh, then I'm going to tell a bit about the pollution state at the North Northern site, especially with the, to the ground uh, soil and the ground water. Yeah. Might be a little bit uh, de detailed, so uh, I'll try to explain. And uh, if it's too complicated, we we'll just uh, go through it a little bit quick. No, that wrong again. Just to just to also tell you that this is the way we've been doing this in, in Norway, it's not a very scientific way of, of doing it. It's uh, it's sort of um, uh, we th this is done as standard on almost every site in Norway. Uh, and and it's doing it by the Norwegian. We have this set of guidelines that we use on almost every site. So it's not very. Uh, we have been thinking about new things or new remediation technologies or doing a lot of research concerning to that because this is this is a description of of the standard actually way that we do remediation in Norway. Um, we, if we start looking first at the authorities that we have that work with, with contamination, uh, we have on the highest level is Norwegian Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, they have the responsibility for making uh, the regulations and the guidelines. Uh, of course, the regulations are also by, on, on ministry level, but they, they are doing the, the base work for doing the regulations. And they are handling some of the most complicated cases in Norway as well. And then we go down one level, we get to the county that uh, Jan also mentioned is, is quite um, uh, working a lot with the plants and those things. They also have responsibility for, for contamination and pollution. And they do very mo many of these specific industrial cases as for example, shipyards and uh, sort of industrial sites where people have uh, the, or factories have been working and have a permit to actually pollute and then it's the state's uh, responsibility to follow them up. Um, and then if we go down to the municipality, they have the local projects. Uh, and uh, 
we have this uh, act in Norway that says that you're not allowed to, to dig or do anything uh, in the ground unless you have checked out the contamination. And that is on the municipality uh, level. So if you're going to build something, construct something or do something, then you have to, to then the, the municipality is the authority that you, that you are uh, communicating with. And um, these are sort of controlling each other. So if you are having contact with the municipality, and you send them um, to a document, a plan, if you want to do something, and then you get a permit, or maybe you don't get the permit, uh, you get the, the um, you, that they say that you know you, you can't have a permit, you have to do more research before, before you give us the permit. Or maybe they give you a permit that says you're going to do it that, and that, and that way. And if you're not satisfied with the permit, you can get to the higher level. If you are in municipality, you can get to the county and then say, we're not satisfied with this. We want to complain. And then you send it there and they keep uh, taking the, the go through the project and see if they think you have if you really should complain, or they can just say, no, this is good enough, then you, you have to, to uh, use the, the permit that you got from the municipality. And if you are on, on the county level, then you can send such a complaint to, to e the Norwegian EPA, and it's the same. And if you get a permit from the EPA and not satisfied, you can go up to the ministry level with your complaint and see. So there is always, possibility to include more authorities if you think you have been bad treated by, <laughs> by someone somewhere. Um, where did I put this one? Uh, if we talk to uh, about, about the legislation, we have this, as, as Janne mentioned, it's the Pollution Act. It's paragraph seven, and that one says, in my translation, no one can have, do, or start up an activity that can cause pollution without having a permit. So actually you can do anything that will make a risk for pollution without having this permit. And um, this is also very close connected to the polluter pays principle which is that the one who is polluting the site is the one who is going to pay for the remediation. And that's very important, actually, in, in this law, because you, you have been very clear about who is responsible for doing things. Um, yeah. Uh, if we go to the sentence, no one can have or do, then you have, if you're going to start, you, you, you can have a sort of pollution lying in the ground, which is maybe might be not very, very dangerous or problematic. But if you start doing something with it, you start digging, you start spreading the material, you start uh, exposure and do things, and that's not allowed. And that is what happens in very many cases uh, everywhere, because you, you don't need to have very severe contamination, but when it's defined by the guide, guidelines and, um, and uh, the quality criteria that it is a contamination, I'll show you that later afterwards, then you must have a permit. It's not allowed to do anything unless you have this permit. And of course your plan, if it's quite a simple case, can be a, a, a quite a, a simple plan but you always need to have a plan and you need to have the permit before you start doing anything. So that's a, a, a law that applies to everything that is done in Norway. And for example, if you're gonna dig a hole for something in the middle of Oslo, you can't do anything without having those permits uh, due to, to uh, pollution. Um, and when it comes to this do, since this is so many areas that where this actually is a problem, we have made no regulation uh, concerning that thing. And this is 
um, regulation called, and it's my translation again, remediation of contaminated ground soil during construction and excavation. And um, this regulation says that in case you have a suspicion of contamination, uh, then you have to check it out by investigation, surveying, sampling. And if you find that you have a contamination here, then you will have to do risk assessment. You will have to make a plan on how to treat this contamination so that you won't cause any spreading and exposure that could be dangerous to humans or, or uh, nature around surroundings. Maybe, maybe I should also say, uh, you, you have a plan, and when you have a plan, you apply for your permit, and if you get the permit, and then you do the works, and then you will also have to have a document in the end, uh, reporting that you did a thing according to the plan, that you have cleaned the site to, to the specific criteria that was set for the site, and that this is done uh, probably and that you have, uh, have delivered everything you should deliver to a landfill and you have to document everything you do all the way. And as you said, these, these, um, uh, the, the Building Act uh, also says that when you're finished with your building, you need a certificate that tells everything is okay. And if you do not deliver your uh, end report for contamination, you won't get that certificate. So you can start use your building until this is documented and finished. Okay. Ah, wrong again. So here comes the guidelines. And as Dalibur mentioned, these are the guidelines for investigation. And this is describing how to investigate and evaluate your results, and including the risk assessments, how you do these risk assess assessments and what they should, should contain. And um, it's, uh, let's see here. This is actually an, an old example that I have the picture of here. This is totally now digital, and you can go into the to the websites of the Norwegian authorities and find this guideline. And uh, it's quite detailed and uh, explaining a lot of things. And it's also included a uh, spreadsheet for this, uh, doing this risk assessment. And uh, as we say, this is based on human health. Everything that is in this guideline is based on human health. And um, you see, then we have these, uh, one, one of the most essential thing in this guideline is the classification of this quality criteria for contaminated soil. So this is something that the authorities has, has uh, applied. And um, they have been doing this classification of criteria for you can see, I hope you can see at least <laughs> for, for different sort of contamination, you have the heavy metals in the top, and you have DDT, PCBs, PAH, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and uh, oil, uh, typical specific uh, species of oils, and some other uh, components. And all these uh, classes are made from, from a risk assessment of how dangerous this is for human beings. So it's based on, on the health of human beings, and uh, as you can see, then the, the classification is made up of, the, they have the blue, the class one, that is not polluted. So these are the, the um, uh, concentrations under the blue limit, then it's not considered contamination. And if you go over to the green uh, classification, the, the number two, then you have a contamination. And when you cross that border, then everything that is in the law and the legislation is applied. 
then you have to do everything. So actually you all sometimes have to do what we call, I call sort of paragraph work. I mean, you might have a few values crossing that border and then you have to do a sort of simple plan and simple evaluation of thing, things. But it's, then it's considered a contamination. Then you have um, the three, and you have you more contamination you have, then you have class three, four, and five. Uh, and five is, that is, the three is the moderate, the four, the orange one is, is bad, and the red one is what we call real, real bad. <laughs> and if you cross the upper limits for the class five, then it's considered a hazardous waste. So that's one of the most essential thing in this guideline. And then next essential thing is that these guidelines are connected to what you're going to use your land for. Yeah. I wanted to ask about this uh, contamination level. So uh, you can use this grant, uh, or can you, uh, when you have, you said when it, uh, the values uh, are over the red one, then it, it is considered as hazard waste, and then it should not be used, or what? Um, it's, it's, if, when, when you're doing such a construction or a digging or something, you will never be allowed to let it be lying back in the ground. It always have to be, be dig up and, and taken away. So you never are allowed to have it unless there are real, real, real high costs, expenses and low sort of um, environmental value for doing it. But n almost never. I've heard sometimes that it, they were allowed to have uh, some floating creosote lying 40 meter under groundwater level, uh, <laughs> under clay somewhere, then they could just let be there because they considered that taking it up and, and remediate the site would be worse than actually let be lying in the ground. But that's very, very seldom that happens. Um, these uh, these um, quality criteria are very close linked to these guidelines. I'm sorry, everything here is in Norwegian. I didn't have time to, to uh, translate it. But here you have this, um, let's see. You see, this is for the residential use area and this is for the urban use. And that is almost the same as you have for the industrial use, I didn't show that, uh, that uh, 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 slide. But here you can see you have the soil here and here you have the limit for the upper meter. So this is regulations for the upper meter and this is regulations for the deeper lying soil. And in a residential area, you can never have anything more than green values. You can have green and blue, but you can't have yellow, orange, or red ones. And this is, of course, because in this, this um, upper meter and the profile, you will be more um, be in contact with the soil. You have children sitting digging in the soil. They are getting the soil on the, their skin, and they put the fingers in the mouth, and they get it in by the oral intake, and, and they, they are exposed for dust that comes from this area. So that is why the criteria are much more uh, strong in the upper, upper meter. And then you have this deeper lying soil. There you can have this yellow values, class three is allowed. And you can also have this class four. But if you have class four, then you have to have a risk assessment that can um, document that it's okay both according to human health and to spreading to the environment. Uh, if we look at the urban uh, site, you have the same uh, in the picture. You have this top layer, first meter. There you can have this class number three or better in the top. And that is because the exposure risk is much more 
much less in, in an industrial or, or in an urban area because you have asphalt, you have hard surfaces and you have uh, parking places and things like that and you don't, you don't get the same uh, exposure to the contamination in such kind of areas. Uh, and then you also have the same, you can have this class five, four and five, also five in the, the deeper layer with a risk assessment. And um, then it's also the same that you, you will not be exposed in the same way in an area like that. If you go to the industrial site, it's just the same as the urban site, but you can also have uh, this classification number four in the top. And that again is if you have sort of airports, uh, roads, uh, so gas stations and such things where you're not exposed in the same way. Yes? Um, so from what, I, from what I understand is uh, even after you've decided that a certain area is in a certain color, like a green or yellow, and you've remediated that area, you still cannot have anything else that is not defined within the legislation there, even yeah. after it's remediated. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, I also have another question. Yes. Apologies. <laughs> it was regarding the legislation. Uh, do you have within your, um, what would you call it, uh, sort of a repository with uh, defined areas which are uh, which were industrial before, that they are defined to, to have potential contaminants? Or it, it does, does that, um, every, does every single project, <coughs> regardless of area where it is, need to have, um, um, <coughs> uh, what would I call it? <laughs> does every single project need to first determine whether or not there's a common contamination in the ground? Or do you have a plan that says, okay, this ground used to, have, used to be industrial and you need to have uh, a plan to see if it's contaminated? Uh, this, this legislation I was talking about, this is when you're going to do something. Dig something, construct something, or do something. But if you have a bad site <laughs> with a lot of contamination, you can get uh, um, uh, leg. <laughs> well, you can get, you can get uh, 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 instruction from, from the authorities that this is a bad site, you will have to, to investigate it. So, so, so it's not always uh, connected to that you are going to do something. Right, right. But if you are going to do something, then you have to take in account what kind of aerial use are you going to use it for in the, in the future and what kind of use do you want to, to, to um, uh, remediate for. So if you have certain of an area that is, uh, has been an industrial site and you want to have uh, urban, uh, urban uh, aerial use, then you can do that, but then it's not allowed to have any uh, residential buildings or houses or something on the site. Right, right, right. Then you have to do another remediation again to meet those criteria to, for that, that use. I want to, not, not that this is realistic, but say that I want to build a house somewhere in Norway. Yeah. And that area uh, was not in the past industrial, or it is not known that there are any contaminants. Do I still need to make tests on the ground to see whether or not there are contaminants? No. no. If you know, have no su suspicion, then you don't have okay. to do anything. But in, in, in many cases, you can be just clear, everyone is uh, okay with, the, we, we don't have a suspicion here. But in some areas, we can have this, uh, the, the people who want to build something say, oh no, there's no sus suspicion here. But if there are doubt about it, then you, you have to ask a consultant and come with a statement or a short report that goes through the history and says, okay, this is, uh, this is uh, a risk for contamination or this is not a risk for contamination. And if this report says, no, it's not, then you will not have any, any obligations to do anything more on that site. Um, here See, we were talking about this um, land use. Uh, one almost uh, also important thing here is that these classifications can also be reused on the site. So say if you have to dig up uh, this class three due to maybe you're making a parking basement or something, so you have a lot of masses containing uh, uh, class three, then you can redeposit and reuse it in the area if you fulfill these conditions here. If you have a, an area where you can have it in deeper lying 
uh, material. So it's it's allowed to to get it back. Although it's, although it, it does, uh, if it does uh, not uh, leaking out. Uh, yeah, and you, of course it's it's okay. But this the class two and three almost uh, allowed allowed to be reused, and four and five you have to have good documentation that it's no leaking and and no problem with any exposure. But it's actually been more and more. Uh, sort of, uh, they actually, the authorities want to reuse uh, the material because we have had strong, there, there's also a strong link between, see back to this one, you see between this number one and number two class, if you have a site in Norway and you have excess soil with contamination in class two, it's regarded contaminated and you have to send it to a landfill. And the consequence of that is that quite a lot of actually useful material with quite little contamination, contamination have been um, filled up with quite called simple uh, contamination. Uh, you were to Langøya uh, for, a, for a, a visit there and, and watch that. And that is a, actually a, a deposit for hazardous waste, but they have also taken a lot of very little contaminated soil for deposition there. And it's been actually a lot of critics in Norway because you're using such a good site and fill it up with something that is quite harmless actually. But that is the regulation for today. So if you have a contamination, even if it's very slightly contaminated, you take it out of the site and then you have to, to deliver it to a landfill. Uh, see, here we said something about the industrial uh, guidelines as well. Um, this is essential number three. We've discussed that a bit with, with uh, you as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't see. Um, if, if you have a suspicion that uh, the land is contaminated, maybe severely, um, analysis of that land can make private laboratories or state laboratories, like some state institutes or or something like that, or university institutes. If they can make the the uh, the surveys, was that the no, question? Uh, Sorry, I didn't no, hear. Analysis on that land can make private laboratory uh, analysis on some severely contaminated land. Yes, they can. Yeah, private. But but you always the, the sur surveys and investigations had to be be done by people with with certain competence. And also for the lab laboratories, you have to, as, as long as it's possible, you should use accredited methods for, for this and standard methods for analysis. Yeah. I would like to, 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 to uh, use this situation when Austin's are going uh, to ask, for example, uh, for the example of Dugirat, uh, they want to. Uh, Built here hotels for touristic purpose. Uh, can you get back to the, 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 the slide before this? Because this is very uh, And for example, they have uh, down there in the, in the ground level uh, category four. Do you think it is it appropriate to cover all this area with one meter of clear stone and build hotels about that? Is it in accordance with your regulation? Yes, it could be if you have the documentation that this class four lying down in the ground is not leaching and not having any effects on the environments around to the sea, to the organisms in the sea. And, and as we said about this classification, it's health-based, but it's now a new proposal for these uh, the classes in Norway, and there are ecological um, um, yeah, ecological uh, also made from the, the base uh, included in the evaluation of if it's okay. So these uh, classes are going to be even even um, stronger or lower values because it's going to take into consideration uh, earth uh, living organisms and uh, ecological. Uh, ecological risks for, for earth living organisms. 
So it's been a hearing for it now, uh, was uh, last spring, I think. And then a lot of comments has been coming in to the authorities from consultants and people having these problems and research and universities and all that. So I'm not sure where it's going to land, but probably a lot of, or at least a least of these uh, values is going to be even stronger. So, um, but, but it's always, it's always uh, a question of risk, all the way. These classes are quite, um, it, it's, they've been established to, to get sort of um, easy uh, requirements for the municipality to handle. Uh, and and uh, they are almost, it's a guideline, but it's almost a law that you have to do it. Uh, let's go further to the essential number three. How many samples do we need? And we have included in this guideline, we have, uh, as you see here, we have um, the, um, here again, you have the land use, this is the residential use, this is the urban use, and this is the industrial and traffic use. And here is the size of the site, how big is it? And here is the number of samples that you need. And these are samples uh, in, in the topsoil, but also as far down as you need to take samples to get control of the, the situation. And as you can see here, we have, uh, if you have, uh, for example, then 5,000 square meters of, of uh, site, then you have to have at least 16 samples if you're in a residential area and at least 12 samples if you are in an industrial area. And then if you have more than 5,000 for each thousand uh, extra square meters, you have to have two more samples. So that means for 10,000 square meters, you need 26 samples. Uh, this is the guidelines for, for um, uh, homogeneous uh, spread of contamination. If you have also, you know, you have hotspots on the, in the area, you know where these hotspots are, then you will have to take even more samples here to, uh, if you have 5,000 square meters, you need 24 samples to just to locate and, and uh, define these hotspots. And if you have a uh, hotspot with a site with hotspots that you don't know where the, the, the um, source is, then you have to have even more. Uh, maybe, maybe I did a slide on that one too. Yes, I did. Uh, so if you have hotspots and you don't know where your hotspot is, which might be the case here in Dugirat, and might actually be the case at also at Nordodden. We have actually used these guidelines, which is quite rare. We don't do that very often, but we're using these on, on the Nordodden site. And then you see if with, with 5,000 square meters, you need 40 samples for, uh, for, uh, to get a representative view on the contamination. So it's quite a lot of samples. We do need quite a lot of samples to, to do the right uh, risk assessments and to do uh, to the right uh, um, evaluation of, of things. Then you drilling, drilling some stone. Hmm? Then you have a drilling down the samples. We be, do the sampling either by drilling and taking up with so the screw driver getting the soil up or we do the digging with sampling with uh, with the digging machine digging uh, here you have the same database as um, Jan also showed you a picture from this is a national database uh, with uh, every contaminated site in Norway or it should at least be every contaminated site unfortunately it's not that bad good updated so it's not like you can, you can check out a site in that database and be sure that it's no contamination there if it's not in the database. Uh, but this was started up the first 
national uh, um, control of polluted sites in Norway started in 1989, and it was a sort of desktop study where where they were going through history of many old sites and uh, checking out if there was a risk for contamination, and it was put in this database. And um, you can zoom in to the map. You can see here you have the red sites. These are, are sites that we have unacceptable uh, remediation, and there's a need for, for no, sorry, accept, an acceptable pollution and need for remediation. And then you have the yellow ones, which is that you have a contamination, but it's acceptable with the land use you have today, according to the, the slides I show you. Uh, and you have the lila ones, that is, we have, we think there might be uh, contamination here, but we haven't surveyed anything yet. So this is the database that we use to show uh, what, what we have, and as I said, this is not being uh, quite more strict when you have a project. If you do not deliver your uh, concluding report and report to this database, you won't get your certificate that you're finished. So it's been quite much um, um, difficult to get, get away with not reporting to the database. So this is going to be better, I hope. Is this database public? Yes. It's public. So anyone can go in here and see. I, I can provide you with the links if you want to just see how it works. And then you, you, you see I've zoomed to the Notodden site there, the red area. And as we can see also here, it's not updated because we have a lot more of samples than you, is shown in, in that picture. Um, and you can, when things become public, uh, you can go in there, you can find our reports which is in the database, you can find everything that document what has been done on, on the site. So it's a really good tool, but it has to be updated, like every tool. <laughs> this was a bit about the laws and the legislation, so now let's move over to, to the note of the site. And um, as we said in the beginning, um, we have this agreement between the municipality and first TINFOS, and then TINFOS, that part of TINFOS that was uh, responsible for the contamination was sold to Aeromet Norway in 2008, and all their obligations have been transferred to Aeromet. And I've been working for Aeromet uh, with a good cooperation with Notodden Kommune all the way, but Edomet is the one that's pay, paying the, the price for all my reports and all the sampling we do and everything. And um, uh, but I, I uh, my opinion is that Edomet has been doing a real good work with that. They are they are trusting us that we do the right thing, and they have been paying for what they should pay for without any discussions. Don't you agree? All of this is very good. Good. Cooperation, yeah. And uh, I know they have been shifting both personnel and board in Eremit Norway the last years, and I think they are they can't understand why they're using so much on these not southern sites where they don't have any activity anymore. But they they accept that they they have to do it. As you saw the pictures, uh, Jana showed a lot of nice pictures, and this is how it used to be. I think this aerial view is from 1969, and I'm not sure about the, the other one, what year it was, but... In the 30s, I think. Hmm? In the 1937. 1937, yeah. yeah. So it's quite old, and that was how it was then. This is how it is today. At least it's not totally new, but... Uh, uh, I think it's one year old picture or something. And as you can see, we have um, this area has been, these are some old buildings that have been there for a long time. And then you have some construction ongoing, like here in the middle. They are almost finished. And then you have the infrastructure area here. 
And this part of the remediation started in 2019. And this, that was called the Bok and Blueshus, was remediated, I think, in 2012, was it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my first visit to this site was in 2006. Uh, we did some sampling uh, and uh, started up the process then. And uh, I know the first um, sampling was done, I think, in 1994, 95. I had a colleague being on the site at that time, but that was most of get technician uh, investigations. But that these investigations are in the contract with Eramet and uh, Tinfos and and uh, Norton municipality. So in Norway, things also take time before things happen. Uh, but again. Here you have the aerial plan that Janne also showed. You see we have this um, infrastructure thing, started in 2019, finished. You have this area here, almost finished. You had these parks here, as we is ongoing now. You saw some pictures from that. You have this area here that is actually no plans for. We know, don't know what's going to happen there and when it's going to happen, and not here either yet. And this is probably going to be sometime in between 2025 and 30. Isn't that right, Olaf? That's it's it's not it's not a set set plan yet. So we don't not sure about that. Uh, when it comes to to the contamination and the geology. We have a moraine and a river deposit here, which means we have a lot of sand, gravel, and cobblestones in the, in the ground. And then we have a lot of film material of this production rests. We have cinder, we have uh, slag, concrete uh, rests, and, and uh, quite a lot of metal waste from the old factories. And um, we have also still a lot of uh, concrete structures and floors left in the ground, which makes sampling and handling quite difficult because we have to penetrate and go through these, uh, these layers to get down to the underlying soil. Um, and there's no structure in the deposition. It's dumped, uh, and you come with a lorry, and you dump, and on one lorry you have very contaminated things, and on the other lorry you have clean things. So there's no structure in how it was deposited. Everything is just dumped in a, in a dif difficult way to... to um, Con to, to survey. Uh, we have a groundwater level about five, six meters on the terrain, and the main problem on the site is this high contamination of polyaromatic hydrocarbons and some heavy metals in the ground. We are very, very lucky because this is quite a stable material, so we don't have very much contamination in the groundwater, luckily. Then it m would have been much worse. Here are the results from an investigation we did now in 2023. I've been just been delivering a report to Eramet and Oton Komune on that part of the site. Um, and this is just an example of how we present these data with these uh, classes. So it's quite easy to see. You see, you get a, a good view uh, directly about what, what you actually have. Is there a problem or is there not a problem? And as you can see here, we have this classification number five, close to almost nothing, and uh, these class four, class three, class two, all over. And when we present the data, we put it on maps, like this thematic maps that shows uh, what we have on each specific point. And this is the map for zero to one meter that says upper layer in the, this area here. And as you can see, quite a lot of these uh, points are higher than these acceptance criteria for the upper meter that was green and blue. So you see it's a lot of, of uh, material that's gonna be, have to be taken away here because it's too highly contaminated. If we go down to 
next map, this is example from three to, oh, sorry. That was three to four meters under the surface. This is a little bit lower surface than the, this part of the area, which is a little bit higher on the terrain. So here we are starting to approach our groundwater. Uh, the, the level on the lake is about code 16, 15.8 or something. So we are three to four meters up here, then we are approaching the ground level, uh, which is corresponding very closely to, to the lake. And as you can see here, we have some red spots that we have to handle, because if you remember, red spots are not allowed in this residential area, so they have to be taken away. Uh, these are the results from the groundwater sampling from one of our uh, groundwater wells. Let's go up again, I'll show you. This is actually this point. And as you can see, in this point, we have classification five in groundwater uh, level, about the groundwater level. So this is, that's the, the um, that's the well and these are results from that well. And we started monitoring in 2019, and then we had samples for every second month, the first year. And then our permit from the state account says that we have to, to uh, monitor every month while digging. So when activity on the site, then we have to take samples. And as you can hear, see here, we are comparing this to the EU European standards for uh, quality criteria in fresh water. Uh, so this uh, might, be, might be known to you. Uh, these are not specific Norwegian values, but standard values from, from you. And as you can see, this actually is not for groundwater, uh, but we are comparing it uh, to these criteria uh, anyway, because this groundwater is very soon going to pass out to the lake and be uh, underlain these uh, criteria. So that's why we just do the comparison with it. And then we must know also that groundwater naturally contains a little bit more of uh, heavy metals than, than the surface water actually usually does. But as you can see here, we have a lot of blue values even in the groundwater. We have a lot of green values also in the groundwater. And then we have some uh, yellow values and some orange values. This was the first, uh, first uh, monitoring we did. Might be affected that the, the groundwater wells was a little bit fresh and we had had some digging in this area around here when having this one. But further on, you can see that even if we have class three in the groundwater, uh, it's not going to be diluted in a very strong way to get down to these green values. I think it's about maybe three to five times dilution to, to get good uh, quality in groundwater. And that's good to know since one of the, the things we, we need to know is that we don't pollute, pollute the lake outside. That's what we talked about. Instead, we could, we could have, uh, it's, it's okay to have this classification for if it doesn't give any pollution out to the lake. Uh, do I have time to say a little bit about our risk assessment model? Uh, this model is something that is included in these guidelines we talked about earlier. And as you can see here, we have here the, the, the model, you start with the soil, and then here you have humans, and here you have the way you can get exposure from the soil. You can have it from, from contact, direct contact with the earth, and you can have it by getting for contaminated earth in your mouth, so by oral intake. Uh, you can have it by spreading to water, and uh, if you use the water for drinking water, you can be exposed for drinking water. Uh, and plants, vegetables, things you eat might take up contamination from the water, and you can get exposed. 
And you can also have exposure for animals here, which is mainly fish uh, in, in the model. Uh, I know it's been considering about also sort of cows, sheep uh, grazing on contaminated, uh, contaminated ground, but that is not considered to be such an important part of it. So it's not included in the model and not milk from, from animals either. But this is mainly fish, so if you eat fish, you can get exposed. And then you have also from the soil up to the air, and then you can be exposed by gases. So that's the basic uh, for the model with the exposure waste. And this is a spreadsheet, uh, Excel spreadsheet, quite simple to use. And um, as all the mo other models, Apologize for that, but uh, shit in means shit out. So you have to be a little bit careful what you put into the model. Um, and here you have a part of the input part of the model. You see here, this is, uh, this is intake by earth for children and for grown-ups. That means what we talked about, the, the um, putting fingers in the mouth Eating, uh, eating earth, as kids love. <laughs> then you have uh, this um, uh, contact with your skin and uh, outside exposure and uh, all, all those exposures that we were talking about. Groundwater, uh, vegetables and fish. And many of these uh, exposure ways are when we talk about this, this assessment that, that it's, it's shown here, it's made for the, the deeper lying material. So many of these are not actually relevant. And then you can just put in that it's not relevant, you set the, the number of hours or time to zero because that's not a relevant exposure way. And Outside, you have this standard values that we use if we don't know that we have uh, other values to use. But then for outside, you can put in then that you have 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Uh, here we have taken out this um, drinking water because it's not used anything as drinking water. And we have uh, said that this not any uh, uh, explanation via um, vegetables grown on the site. And then we have said that this 20% part of intake from fish. 100% uh, means that you eat one kilo of local fish a week, and that's not happening at Nordon. So we have said it's uh, okay, say 200 grams a week, one, one uh, uh, dinner a week from local fish. I don't think that's, uh, it's, it's not happening in that either, but to be conservative, we, we put those values in the model. And then you also change your transport and spreading process, the process in the earth. Uh, you have the uh, water content, you have the air content, you have the porosity, you have different things. And one important thing to put in here that means quite a lot of difference, it is the organic content of the earth. So that's an important thing to adjust. And then you have some other parameters for, for uh, uh, calculating the gas, what you get into your air. And there, here also is for the groundwater, what you have in your groundwater. So you put the data in and you tell about how much yearly precipitation do you have and how big is the area, the length of the area and the width of the area. And then you also put in the, the water flow in your recipient down, downstreams. And the, the more data you have in these uh, calculations, the more site-specific assessment you will get. You can do the calculation with the standard values as well, but if uh, the more you know that is uh, site-specific, the better it is.
here are some here are some results from from this calculation we made and you can see here we have this different components that we've been calculating for here you can see we have number of samples that was the input in the model and you can see here this has been using just for this specific area we are uh, surveying now and the, this so these are 83 samples and for some components 90 samples and then you get out the maximum values and uh, the medium values and then you get out these accept criteriances that will will the values that will will provide on on the um, the site and these are based on human health as i said and maximum tolerable daily intake and values for that is standard input in the model it's it's lying in the model so you don't have to to think about that and then you will get a view of does your values exceed these accept criterions uh, or is it Okay, and as you can see here, for most of, of uh, the um, components, it's okay. You don't exceed and you don't have any problem with, with those values. Here you get a, a specific for the health risk, the MTDE. And as you can see here, we have uh, exceeding for uh, some PAH 16 with 15%, but this is only for the maximum value, which was really high. And since we have this, this uh, regulations that we don't uh, allowed to have class five in the area when we're finished here, these are gonna get out anyhow. So it will be excluded from, from the area. This is for the children, this is for the grown-ups, and this is for the, uh, health risk in, in a lifetime. And as you can see, all the values are very good close to this. But if we had done this risk assessment for the upper part, where we have much more exposure than we have in the lower uh, profile part of the profile, then this would have been totally different. You also get from the model, you get a view of what kind of exposure is actually the problem. You have, as you can see here, for example, for cover, uh, the total uh, explanation ex uh, from cover is from fish. It might be a little bit difficult to see here, but it's from fish. And then you go to, for example, naphthalene, which is a quite easy soluble um, uh, PAH, uh, then you have it all from gas. And then you can do, uh, when you, you start doing your plan, you can also see, okay, if it's not acceptable by the guests, then you have to do anything that will, will handle gas in the project. So this is a very illustrative way of, of see what is actually the problem for each thing, each uh, uh, contamination. Uh, we also have now a risk assessment uh, tool for not for only for human health, but also for the spreading of, uh, of uh, contaminants. And here you can see the result from you always also get a lot of tables uh, with different values, but the result is also represented in this diagram. And uh, here you have concentration in water, micrograms per liter, and here you have the time lapse. 100 years, 20 years, 40 years. And as you can see here, you have, this is the poor water concentration con uh, calculated, you have here, and then you have the EQS values for this specific stuff. It's lead, hope I said this is for lead. And um, here you have the groundwater calculated concentration, and here you have the calculated uh, res recipient concentration. So, as you can see here, we're very happy that we have, we are not even close to the EQS values in the recipient. We have the EQS here, and then here is the, the values for the recipient. And which is also good to see it, uh, is that also the groundwater, calculated groundwater concentrations is also good below the EQS values. So we don't have to be scared that, that this lead 
is going to give us concentrations in, in the residue. That was for the heavy metal, and uh, we also have for this naphthalene, which is a little bit different picture. Here you can see that the, this is quite easy soluble, so, so the concentration will go quite down quite quick, or well, 20 years, but it's going to go down. And also in the recipient, it's going to go quite quick down. And here you have uh, the uh, EQS values and the groundwater values is here. So we also are good, uh, good due to, due to this, these uh, uh, EQS values here. I hope this was understandable. It's quite detailed, so I just wanted to show you what these are. These are standard requirements for when you do those things in Norway. Um, and you have to do, as you saw in the start, if you have contamination in class four, you have to do this risk assessment. And you have to use this tool. And you have to document, uh, both with your, your uh, calculations and m measured values, real measured values, that, you, that this is not a risk due to your site. Um, so, okay, finished with, uh, with the planning, finished with the, the investigations, the samples and all thing, then you, you do your plan. Uh, and, and you have to describe all your results and with these maps I showed you on tables. And also you have to, to tell how are we going to treat this contamination when we dig it up, if that's what we need to do. Uh, how do we handle it? How do we store it while before we, we take it out of the area? Uh, how can we be sure that we don't um, do any, any spreading or, or exposure, both while we're working with it and on short term, long term. So everything has to be documented in the plan. And if you work for a municipality, you send the plan, you usually just get uh, um, maybe a short permit that says, this is OK, do it according to the plan. If you work for the, uh, or the state authorities uh, or the county authorities, they will probably give you a permit that is much, much more detailed and you have to do this and you have to do that and, uh, and uh, sort of more, might be coming even more um, uh, strong um, requirements than you had in your plan. That happens, that they disagree about, say that you have to document this and this and this as well. So that happens when we work for the, uh, the county, but seldom when we work for municipalities. Um, you saw some pictures from Janne and what is going on there by now. This is pictures from the sampling we did August this year. You see these crane uh, constructions. And uh, so and we were digging quite close to, to the site, to, to the water site. And on the picture here, you can see, I, you can't see what contamination you have here. But I don't remember what, what uh, test pit this was. But seeing the, the results, uh, seeing the colors, I would assume this is class four. And here we had an example for the infrastructure project in 2019, uh, where the entrepreneur was he was checking actually the wrong map, so he digged a little bit more than he had to do. But it was a good, <laughs> good way to see what we actually have. These are the, the natural ground under. Here you have the groundwater uh, level, and here you have the digging and the dumped material. I think here we have some concrete rests or something. Here you have these uh, darker, almost black material. Uh, and covered with something that is looking quite clean. And here you have something looking quite clean. So this is, this is what we can expect to find when we dig here. It's sort of bingo what we find when we dig. 
and it, we were very lucky when we get we were getting down and we yeah now we've reached the natural ground that's good that's always good to to do because uh, we always in, in these outer parts of the area it was always also filled out uh, with um, uh, material in in the water but it's it's not as you had here 40 meters but it's like uh, quite four four or six meters underground so we, we are quite close to to the um, groundwater level and then m very much coarse material in the deep and uh, a little bit sorry wrong again a little bit nerd nerd picture this is uh, this is not good but it's sort of beautiful anyway <laughs> But this is also, uh, you can see we have this concrete with the arming up here. So we have been uh, digging through it and then we have different types of material all the way down through. So this is a test pit that's about uh, four meters deep in total. And we, you can see here uh, when the picture is taken, we have not reached anything that is beginning to look good yet. Okay, I think I've used the time, but I'm almost finished. I just wanted to say something about the cost because I guess you wonder. Um, so far, we've been digging out about 34,000 tons of contamination, and we have it has been transported to a landfill in Norton. We are very lucky because we have a landfill close here. Sometimes in Norway, you will have to transport things far away. But we are close, it's just a few kilometers to go. And this has been mainly this criteria four and five. And this has been to a cost about 1.82 million euros. And for the future plants uh, that I showed you on the map, it's about, well, about 70,000 tons more to a cost of about 300,000, 3, 3 million euros. And for my work that I've been doing for the last five years, we just passed two million Norwegian crown in the consulate and, uh, and the, um, the, for the analysis things we have been doing, uh, which is about uh, 200,000 euros. Is it? One, no, 100 euros? Two? No, two. About. Yeah, so that's what was what I was going to tell you about. Thank you for your attention.